Our speaker this evening is Professor David Engelsmutt. He was ordained into the gospel ministry in the Protestant Reformed Churches in 1960, 1963. He served as the pastor of the Protestant Reformed Congregation in Loveland, Colorado from 1963 to 1974, and then was the pastor of the Protestant Reformed Church in South Holland, Illinois from 1974 to 1988 and then served as professor of dogmatics and Old Testament history in the theological school of the Protestant Reformed Churches in Grand Rapids, Michigan from 1988 to 2008. He is now professor emeritus. Though do not be mistaken, the term emeritus in no way indicates a reduction in workload. Professor Engelsma continues to be busy, he preaches in the churches, he speaks, giving lectures not only through the country but recently in the British Isles, Singapore, the Philippines. He continues to teach a doctrine class in West Michigan and especially he writes for magazines and has been writing many books and treating and addressing contemporary, even vexing theological issues Particularly, he has written much, a great deal on the covenant. Very busy. You ought to know that five days ago, only five days ago, while preaching in Loveland, Colorado, Professor Engelsma suffered part of a series of TIAs, what I understand to be minor strokes. And his preaching was interrupted by his own incoherence and confusion of speech. And he was taken to the hospital and spent Sunday, Monday, and part of Tuesday in the hospital in Loveland, Colorado. And then was discharged. And despite the urgings, and understandably so, the urgings of his family members, children, and grandchildren in Michigan to come home and rest and see his own doctor, he believed it to be the will of God to come here. He felt relatively well, came here, and I have been told has not been feeling so well today. And I pray the Lord will answer the prayer I offered and equip him even with physical strength now to be able to deliver this lecture. Professor Engelsma. Thank you for that introduction, Reverend Heisinga. I express my thanks to the Evangelism Committee of the Pope Protestant Reformed Church in Redlands, California for the opportunity to address you on this fundamental truth of the Word of God, the coming of the Kingdom of Christ. Is this the Christianizing of the world? I also express my appreciation to Westminster Seminary in California and to its president, Dr. Robert Godfrey, for opening up these lovely premises for the event of the lecture tonight. The subject of my lecture tonight is the coming of the kingdom or the coming of the kingdom of Christ, followed by a question Christianizing the world is Christianizing the world, the coming of the kingdom of Christ. For more than 100 years now, Reformed Christians, Calvinists, especially in Europe and North America, have had dinned into our ears by fellow Calvinists that it is our duty to, quote, Christianize, end quote, our nation and indeed all the world. This mandate originated with the influential Dutch Reformed theologian, churchman, and politician Abraham Kuyper, and with his colleague, the brilliant Dutch Reformed theologian Herman Bavink. Christianizing the world was especially the theme of Kuyper's six 
Stone Lectures in Princeton in 1898, now published as Lectures in Calvinism. Bavinck, too, was committed to the Calvinistic revival that Abraham Kuyper envisioned. Quote, the re-Christianizing of European culture, end of quote. Basic to this gigantic project for the Dutch theologians of the past century was God's, quote, common grace, end quote. According to Abraham Kuyper and Herman Bavinck, in addition to his special saving grace, which God shows only to the elect, God has also another entirely different grace, which he showers upon all human beings without exception. This grace in reprobate ungodly anti-Christian men and women does three things. It is supposed to restrain sin in them so that they are no longer totally depraved. It enables them to do good works in civil society, including especially their cultural works. And the third thing common grace is supposed to do is develop a good, even godly culture or way of life in a society and nation, outward order, regard for morality, and care for the needy. Now, I notice in passing that these things are attributed by our canons of Dort in the third and fourth heads of doctrine, Article 4, not to a grace of God, but rather to a work of God in nature. In that article, our confession speaks not of grace, but of nature, glimmerings of natural light and the light of nature. And question and answer 91 of the Heidelberg Catechism denies that unbelieving men and women are able to perform good works even in the realm of civil society because question and answer 91 of the Heidelberg Catechism calls all the apparent good works of unbelieving men and women sin. But especially the third operation of common grace, as supposed by the defenders of common grace, is important for the Calvinistic Christianizing of the nation and the world. Christians supposedly share this common grace with the wicked, and therefore can and must cooperate with the ungodly by means of common grace to make a country and then the world Christian. In volume two of his three-volume work on common grace, the Dutch theologian Abraham Kuyper wrote that, quote, there is beside the great work of God in special grace also that totally other work of God in the realm of common grace, end quote. Kuyper continued that the work of common grace is, quote, to consummate the world's development, end of quote. Similarly, the Dutch Reformed theologian Herman Bavinck wrote that, quote, common grace presses forward to the conquest of the entire world, end quote. That's in his book, Calvin and Common Grace. Promoting this mission of Calvinistic Christians in North America today to save the world by common grace is the Christian Reformed Church, especially through its Christian school system and more especially through its colleges. The Christian colleges of the Christian Reformed Church confront the students, and I have firsthand experience with this, being a graduate of Calvin College myself, confront the students with the calling, Christianize America, Christianize America, the world as the solemn calling of all the students from God himself. The schools see as one of their main purposes to prepare the students to transform society into a Christian kingdom. But by no means is the Christian Reformed Church the only proponent of this project as a, if not the chief calling 
of Christians at the beginning of the 21st century. Many evangelicals also preach this mandate. For example, the late Charles Colson. And the Roman Catholic Church has long had this conviction that it is to change society by making it Christian outwardly. Rome understands by the Christianizing of the world, bringing the world under the control of the Pope. Evangelicals have also united with Roman Catholics to fight the culture wars in North America, which is essentially the same as Christianizing America. The organization calls itself Evangelicals and Catholics Together, or ECT. Involved in this enterprise are such evangelical luminaries as Charles Colson, now dead, Richard Mao, and J.I. Packer. These and other prominent evangelicals insist that such efforts involving cooperation with Roman Catholics are right, indeed necessary, as the calling from God to Christianize America, and to do that in face of the rampant demonizing of American culture by the powers of darkness today. Then there is such a militant group of Calvinists bent on Christianizing the United States as Christian Reconstruction. Christian Reconstructionists, disciples of R.J. Rushdooney, himself influenced by Abraham Kuyper, the one main calling of Reformed churches and believers is to rule the nation and the world, thus controlling the culture. Anyone who declines this calling is charged with practicing, quote, impotent religion, end quote. This band of cultural warriors is motivated by their conviction of victory within history, a victory that is guaranteed by their post-millennial eschatology. All of these advocates of making the way of life in nation and world Christian present their project as the coming of the kingdom of God. That's how they describe the effect of their Christianizing the nation and the world. Their message to us is, God is king over all with an absolute sovereignty. This sovereign kingship extends over all of human life, political, science, education, art, all. As Christians, indeed Calvinistic Christians, who know and confess God's sovereignty, we must press God's claims in all spheres of earthly life, we are told. And as we work at this, we may expect God's kingdom to come in answer to our prayers in the second petition of the model prayer, the Lord's Prayer, and by the power of common grace, which we must not forget, according to those who believe it, is also working in the world of the ungodly. Confronted with this calling to Christianize the world by the power of common grace, and warned that if we say no to this project, we shall be judged and condemned as Anabaptists, guilty of the cowardly and unbiblical activity of world flight, we address the issue of the relation of the Christian to the culture of his or her nation and of the world. The coming of the kingdom. Christianizing the world. The phrasing of this topic suggests that the Christianizing of the world is a question, not an established fact. Let us begin by having clearly in mind what the proponents of Christianizing American culture and then the world by means of common grace mean by this. Obviously, they intend that in some sense, 
we are to make the whole of American life Christian, business and labor, science and the arts, education, politics and government, but also marriage and the family. Kuiper famously referred to all the spheres of life in a nation. But Kuiper did not mean, nor do his common grace cultural disciples mean, that a majority of the citizens of a nation are to be converted to Jesus Christ, so that they take over the nation, dominate all the spheres of life in the nation, and thus order life in all the spheres according to the will of God. That is not what those who speak of the Christianizing of the nation have in mind. Abraham Kuyper and his contemporary Common Grace cultural Calvinists recognize that many, indeed the vast majority of citizens, are and remain unbelievers. Atheists, humanists, complete secularists, members of false religions, members of cults, and members of false churches. This is why Kuiper and his contemporary disciples need a common grace of God working in these unbelievers, supposedly making these unbelievers willing to cooperate with Christians in making our nation and then the world a Christian nation and then a Christian world. Apart from this common grace, it is inconceivable that we would make the culture of a majority of unbelievers Christian. In volume two of his three volume work on common grace, Abraham Kuyper described what he meant by making a nation Christian by means of common grace. I quote Abraham Kuyper. Christian, in the phrase Christianizing the nation, says nothing about the spiritual state of the inhabitants of such a country, but only witnesses to the fact that public opinion, the general mindset, the ruling ideas, the moral norms, the laws and customs there clearly betoken the influence of the Christian faith, end of quotation of Abraham Kuyper. The Christianizing of a nation, according to Abraham Kuyper and Common Grace, has nothing to do with the change of the hearts of the citizens of the country, has nothing to do with faith in Jesus Christ or love for God, has nothing to do with obedience to the law of God, from hearts that are aflame, as Psalm 119 puts it, with love for God's commandments as holy, righteous, and good. When a nation is Christianized by Calvinists, Roman Catholics, and devout unbelievers working together by the power of a common grace, the hearts of a majority of the citizens of the nation and then of the world are unregenerated and the citizens are as hostile to Jesus Christ as they were before the Christianizing of their way of life. But there has been an influence upon the way of life of the nation in every sphere, from government to the people's recreation and amusement, an influence that dominates and controls the behavior of a society outwardly. What the defenders of common grace have in mind by this influence of a nation's way of life runs along these lines. The people observe the Sabbath, not by attending a true church to worship the triune one true God, which is in fact the sine qua non of Sabbath observance, but they observe the Sabbath by not working, by not mowing their lawns, and by not scheduling the Chicago Cubs or the Los Angeles Dodgers on Sunday. 
with the authorization of the majority of unconverted members of the Department of Education, this is what they mean who speak of the influence of the nation by common grace, all the teachers in the state schools will teach Genesis 1 and 2 as the possible explanation of origins with the theory of evolutionary science. And the teachers will recommend as reading on the subject the opening chapters of the Bible along with Charles Darwin's Origin of Species. In a Christianized America, as the defenders of common grace envision it, the state schools will also teach all the students that sex before marriage and outside marriage between one man and one woman is sin. Instead of instructing the children to be sexually active and promiscuous and distributing condoms, as the schools do now, in their very definitely unchristianized condition. Of the greatest, indeed fundamental importance for the Christianizing of a nation, as the defenders of common grace envision it, will be the influence of Christianity on the government. The legislative branch, Congress, though composed mostly of unbelievers, will pass laws in accordance with the Ten Commandments as elucidated and applied by the New Testament. All the laws, therefore, will defend the institution of marriage, prohibiting divorce. And I choose laws concerning marriage deliberately. First, solid marriages are fundamental to a stable, healthy society. And second, the honoring of marriage is high on the list characteristics of a Christian society. According to the defenders of common grace, the effect of common grace upon the judicial branch, the Supreme Court, although made up of a majority of non-Christians, will be that they decide all cases brought before the Supreme Court in harmony with the Christian God's condemnation of murder. Therefore, the court will rule that abortion as the murder of the unborn and partially born is unlawful in a Christianized nation. And the Supreme Court will rule that the death penalty is in force for all murderers, including the doctors who perform abortions. Such would be a Christianized America and then a Christianized world. And this, according to Common Grace, Cultural Calvinists is the calling of all Calvinists, indeed the main calling with regard to our relation to the world around us. The common grace cultural Calvinists urge this calling by presenting it as the calling to promote the kingdom of God by viewing the activity of Christianizing the world as kingdom life and activity, and by describing a Christianized nation as the kingdom of God in the world. That's the appeal of the project of common grace. It proposes to promote the kingdom of God. Where the notion of Christianizing the world reigns, kingdom is on everyone's lips, seeking the kingdom promoting the kingdom, the coming of the kingdom. You do not hear much about the church or about the covenant, for kingdom is all to the defenders of common grace. What they mean by kingdom, however, is this outward, visible, earthly state of affairs, that society has been influenced and even outwardly transformed by Christianity. Abraham Kuyper identified the common grace Christianizing of the world as the coming of the kingdom of God. 
at a crucial point in his book, Lectures on Calvinism, the playbook of the Common Grace Project, where he is pleading for the Christianizing of politics, Kuiper appeals to the, quote, sovereignty of the triune God over the whole cosmos in all its spheres and kingdoms, end quote. That is, he appeals to the kingship of God Indicative of Kuiper's view of the project of Christianizing the culture of an ungodly nation is what he wrote in a series of articles on, quote, common grace in science and art, end quote. I quote Kuiper, Christianizing the science and art of a nation is based on the fact that the kingdom of God is not in the least limited to the instituted church, but rules our entire world and life view, end of quote. Kuiper's contemporary disciples, especially in the Christian colleges, emphasize this theme. The Christian instruction of the college proclaims the kingdom. The graduates become agents of the kingdom. Their kingdom mission is the Christianizing of society. To what extent there is some external, earthly, visible influence on some sphere of life in society, that represents the coming of the kingdom of God. Nothing less than the coming of the kingdom of God. The well-known evangelical Charles Colson titled his book on the culture wars and the Christianizing of America, Kingdoms in conflict. From this lofty conception of the common grace cultural project, it follows that the cultural Calvinists are severe in their condemnations of us who do not share their thinking and decline to take part in their effort to Christianize the world. According to the proponents of common grace, we sin. And our sin is nothing less than a deficient understanding of the kingdom of God and the failure to live the kingdom life. Beginning with Kuiper and Bavink, the shaming charge against us Calvinists who reject the culture Calvinism of common grace is that we are pietists and Anabaptists, that is, we are charged with the grievous, plainly unbiblical error of world flight, fleeing the world. We are consigned to the ranks of the Anabaptists of the time of the Reformation. We are put in the camp of Munzer, John of Leiden, and Menno Simons. We are no genuine Calvinists at all. We are no red-blooded children and heirs of Luther, Calvin, and evidently the Reformed Confessions, although I know that the Reformed Confessions offer precious little proof for the theory of common grace. I say plainly unbiblical error of world flight because our Lord forbade world flight. Quote, Pray not that thou shouldst take them out of the world. I have sent them into the world. End quote. John 17, verses 15 and 16. In fact, such is the charge against us who deny common grace and its mission that dissenting from the doctrine of the cultural Calvinists we make ourselves guilty of opposing and obstructing one of the two great works of God in history. And therefore, we are guilty of interfering with one of the two main purposes of God with his world. That great work of God that we are supposed to obstruct and that purpose of God with which we are supposed to interfere 
is the realization of beautiful, noble, good culture by virtue of common grace. The other great work of God, of course, is the salvation of the elect church. Listen to the father of the cultural Calvinists, Abraham Kuyper. I quote, there is a particular grace which works salvation and also a common grace by which God relaxes the curse which rests upon the world, arrests its process of corruption, and thus allows the untrammeled development of our life in which to glorify himself as creator, end of quote. That's quite an ascription of praise and importance to this supposed work of God of common grace. In his work on common grace, Kuyper also wrote, quote, there is beside the great work of God in special grace also that totally other work of God in the realm of common grace. And that totally other work is to consummate the world's development, end of quote. When we, and I speak now on behalf of the members of the Protestant Reformed Churches, and I hope on behalf of other Calvinists, when we repudiate the mentality and mandate of Christianizing the world, the reason is not that we have felt nothing of the tug of Kuypers and the cultural Calvinists' kingdom vision. It is obnoxious to be regarded as Anabaptists and charged in the Reformed community with the fault of fleeing the world. In addition, our blood too stirs at Abraham Kuyper's well-known rousing claim on behalf of his common grace venture. Quote, there is not a square inch in the whole domain of our human existence over which Christ, who is sovereign over all, does not cry, mine, end of quote. Our blood stirs at this line also. Stimulating the urge to be involved in Christianizing at least our nation, which includes engagement in fighting the culture wars, is the advance all across the spheres of life in the United States at present of the kingdom of the beast, the kingdom of Satan, in the form of the kingdom of sovereign, deified man, with a capital M. Holy anger wells up in the soul of the reformed believer as the kingdom of Satan takes over every sphere of life in our nation. Dishonoring God, mocking Jesus Christ and trampling underfoot God's commandments in sheer lawlessness. Politically, the head of the executive branch, our president, advocates sodomite couplings as holy marriages. The judicial branch decrees the murder by abortion of millions who are innocent before the law. The legislative branch is directed not by the will of God, the lawgiver in scripture and in nature, but by the will of the people, by developments in society, and by the desire to retain power. Everywhere, by many means, not least television and the movies, there is an all-out assault on marriage and the home parents and children. Education in the state schools is increasingly godless, not only ignoring God, but also hostile to the God of Christianity, his church, and his word. American society is promoting a life of amusement rather than of work, pleasure rather than duty, self-gratification rather than responsibility. And the amusement, pleasure, and self-gratification are often filthy and violent. 
with the holy anger at this takeover of our country by the forces of spiritual darkness, there is with us the keen awareness that the result of these developments in the United States will soon be persecution of the true church and of faithful, loyal citizens of the kingdom of Jesus Christ. <clears throat> And some of us Calvinists, who are not and are determined never to be Anabaptistic, repudiate the project of Christianizing society, our nation, and the world. That is, when we repudiate culture Calvinism, the explanation is not that we have not thoroughly considered and in examined the project, or even that we are complete strangers to its appeal. But the explanation is that we have weighed the project and found it wanting. Wanting with regard to the kingdom of Jesus Christ and wanting with regard to living the life of the kingdom in all spheres of earthly life. We repudiate the project of Christianizing the world not because we deny that Calvinists must live the life of the kingdom in all spheres of earthly life, much less because we think this unimportant, but rather we, because we judge the project of Christianizing the world as a false conception of the coming of Christ's kingdom, and because we are determined that the kingdom of Christ comes in our life rightly, that is, in accordance with scripture and the reformed creeds. The question for professing Calvinists is this. Is the Christianizing of the world as taught by Abraham Kuyper and by his culture Calvinists today what the Lord had in mind in the second petition of the model prayer Thy kingdom come. I will now present the kingdom alternative of genuine Calvinism. May I ask any culture Calvinist who is present tonight to consider our thinking and activity as we have considered yours. I present what I call the kingdom alternative of genuine Calvinism. A genuine Calvinist lives and must live in such a way as to honor Abraham Kuyper's stirring claim on behalf of Jesus Christ. Quote, there is not a square inch in the whole domain of our human existence over which Christ, who is sovereign over all, does not cry, mine, end of quote. In every sphere of our life, earthly as well as spiritual, in government, education, science, and labor, as well as in prayer and at church, we live the life, the holy life, the unique life of the kingdom of Jesus Christ. In every sphere of life, our behavior and our speech witness that Jesus the Christ is king. Thus, over whatever sphere of life we enter upon, we raise the banner, Jesus Christ is king. Only, and this is of fundamental importance, the Christ Jesus, on behalf of whom we raise the banner, is the man who was crucified, raised from the dead, and now sits at the right hand of God. That's the Christ whose kingdom is coming, and that's the Christ whose kingdom life we strive to live in every sphere of life in the world. The Christ whom we honor and obey is not only the second person of the Trinity, and that's what Kuiper meant by Christ in the famous statement that I have just quoted. He wasn't referring to Jesus Christ, God in the flesh, but he was referring 
to Christ only as the second person of the Trinity. For Kuiper, the kingdom of God and of Christ that Calvinists must promote and advance with the ungodly by common grace is not the rule of God in the crucified and risen Jesus, but a kingdom only of the second person of the Trinity, a kingdom different from the reign of God in the man Jesus. Over against this fatal misunderstanding of the kingdom of God and the grievous misleading of Calvinists regarding their kingdom life and work, let it be clear that when I echo tonight Kuiper's confession, by Christ I mean the crucified and exalted man, Jesus, the Son of God as he is in our human flesh. Over every square inch of the whole domain of our human existence, this Jesus is sovereign. Jesus sits at God's right hand, as the Christian faith confesses in the Apostles' Creed. Calvinists, and indeed evangelicals, all Protestant Christians must know the truth about the kingdom of God, the kingdom of the Heavenly Father, whose coming we pray for in the second petition of the model prayer, Thy kingdom come. The kingdom is the reign of God, the triune God, in Jesus Christ, God's great servant, by the spirit and word of this Jesus Christ. Now there is a rule of the sovereign power of God over all, including Satan, which includes God's rule over the current demonic developments in North America, but this is not the kingdom of God in the world, either in the Old Testament or in the New Testament. The kingdom of God is not a reign of sheer power, but a reign of grace, sovereign, saving, empowering, ruling, particular grace. The grace of the kingdom of God in Jesus Christ transforms rebels into citizens. It makes these citizens willing in the day of Christ's power. This grace makes us believers in and disciples of King Jesus. As disciples, we confess, follow, obey, and serve the risen Lord Jesus Christ. Of this kingdom of God, in Jesus Christ. Not all humans are citizens, but only those in all nations and among all peoples who are true believers and genuine children of believers. We are believers because God, quote, hath translated us into the kingdom of his dear son, end quote. Colossians 1.13, out of the power of darkness, God has translated these persons because he has elected them in eternity. Ephesians 1, verse 4. As to its nature, the kingdom of God's dear son is heavenly, not earthly. Spiritual, not carnal. And this is fundamental to the controversy over common grace. That was Jesus' description of the kingdom to Pilate on the morning of Jesus' establishment of the kingdom by his death, according to John 18, 33 through 37. Quote, not of this world, end quote. End quote, not from hence, end quote. Explaining Jesus' description of his kingdom, John Calvin wrote, quote, spiritual, end quote, quote, heavenly, end quote, and quote, separated from the world, end quote. Commentary on John's Gospel, volume two. 
Therefore, the kingdom of God in Jesus Christ is invisible in its coming. It comes not with observation. Luke 17, verse 21. Romans 14, verse 17 teaches about this heavenly kingdom, that it does not consist of earthly dominion, nor does it provide earthly benefits, but it consists of and bestows to its citizens, quote, righteousness and peace and joy in the Holy Ghost, end quote. One thing more Jesus emphasized to Pilate, and culture Calvinism should pay careful attention to it. The kingdom of Jesus Christ, in distinction from all other kingdoms, including the kingdom of common grace, comes by, quote, the truth, end quote. To Pilate's question to him about kingship and kingdom, as you recognize urgent concerns of Pilate and of Rome, Jesus responded as follows, quote, to this end was I born, and for this cause came I into the world, that I should bear witness unto the truth, end of quote, John 18, verse 37. Now one thing is undeniably evident about the kingdom of common grace that cultural Calvinists are building with the cooperation of Roman Catholics and outrightly ungodly humans. That kingdom of common grace is not coming by the truth. That kingdom is not promoted by the truth, but by other means. Truth is the gospel, as summarized in the Reformed creeds. Roman Catholics and unbelievers who are cooperating, supposedly, with Reformed Christians to establish the kingdom of common grace are not cooperating with genuine Calvinists in preaching the truth. They do not, therefore, cooperate in the genuine coming of the kingdom of Jesus Christ. That the kingdom is heavenly in origin and in nature does not imply that it is not on the earth and in the world. It is. And primarily its location is the heart of the born again believing child of God. There Christ has his throne. There God reigns in Jesus Christ by his grace and spirit. Now Abraham Kuyper and most cultural Calvinists disparage the reign of grace in the hearts of the people of God. Again and again they criticize those Calvinists who emphasize this as though by this emphasis we restrict the kingdom to the heart of the child of God. Kuyper informs us that he launches his grandiose project of common grace precisely against those Calvinists who confess that the kingdom is God's reign in the hearts of the elect. But the rule of God in the human heart is fundamental to the presence of the kingdom on earth. Apart from the rule of God in the heart, whatever outward conformity there may be to Christianity, the entire project is obnoxious to God and is certainly not his kingdom. God looks to the heart. God is pleased with willing service from the heart. In fact, apart from the reign of grace in human hearts, men and women will not, do not, and cannot seek the kingdom of God. They cannot seek it even outwardly. As slaves of Satan, they hate even the appearance of the kingdom of God, and they exert themselves to destroy God's kingdom and build, rather, the kingdom of Antichrist. The idea that unregenerated unbelievers will cooperate with Christians 
to Christianize the world, to make the world Christian, does not reckon with the power of sin in the ungodly. So are they slaves of sin, but they can only hate the kingdom of Jesus Christ. Jesus Christ, the King. God looks to the heart. God is pleased with willing service from the heart. In fact, Apart from the reign of grace in one's heart, men and women will not, do not, and cannot seek the kingdom of God, even outwardly. As slaves of Satan, unregenerated persons hate even the appearance of the kingdom of God. and They exert themselves to destroy God's kingdom and build, rather, the kingdom of Antichrist. And if Christ does rule in one's heart, that man or woman, that young person will and must live the life of the kingdom in all the spheres. The fear of the culture Calvinist that believers will be passive and anabaptistic is groundless. That fear does not reckon with the heart as the source of all the issues of life nor with the mighty, all-comprehensive lordship of Jesus Christ in the heart. Do not underestimate, I beseech you, the reign of Christ in the heart. With this, the Heidelberg Catechism begins its explanation of the second petition of the model prayer concerning the kingdom. Quote, that is, Rule us so by thy word and spirit that we may submit ourselves more and more to thee. End of quote. And the meaning is, rule us in our hearts. That's question and answer 123 of our Heidelberg Catechism. Such is the rule of Christ in the heart of the Christian that he or she submits to Jesus Christ in all spheres of earthly life. Thus the kingdom of God is extended to every sphere. And thus the believer raises the banner over every sphere. Jesus Christ is king. First and foremost, of the spheres of life where the banner of Jesus Christ and his kingdom is raised is the institute of the true church of Jesus Christ in the world. The citizen of the kingdom of God in whose heart God reigns will be a lively member of a true church worshiping the triune God in spirit and in truth every Sabbath day. This aspect of kingdom life is minimized and even ignored by most of the advocates of Christianizing the world by common grace. Not only do they not emphasize this, but they usually say nothing at all about this in their treatises on the kingdom. And that's understandable. If you are trying to create a kingdom with atheists, unbelievers, and Roman Catholics, you had better say nothing about church membership and about church attendance. This is mistaken and utterly inexcusable. The reign of Jesus Christ in and over the church is the second explanation of the second petition of the Lord's Prayer by the Heidelberg Catechism. I quote, preserve and increase thy church, end quote. What does it mean that the kingdom comes? Preserve and increase thy church is what it means. The true church is the institutional form of the kingdom of Jesus Christ. The Westminster Confession of Faith, the Presbyterian Creed declares, quote, the visible church is the kingdom of the Lord Jesus, end quote. Chapter 25, section two. The Belgic Confession says the same when in Article 27, 
concerning the church, which has been from the beginning of the world and will be to the end. The Belgic Confession states, I quote, which is evident from this, that Christ is an eternal king, end of quote. Christ is king of the church, and the church is the kingdom of Christ. The New Testament church is God's holy nation, the reality of Old Testament Israel. The Netherlands under Abraham Kuyper was not the holy nation. Neither is the United States God's holy nation, nor has it ever been, nor is any Christianized earthly nation today or in the future the holy nation of God. The church is God's holy nation. The dream that men can make some earthly nation God's holy nation and kingdom is false and foolish. Addressing the New Testament church of believers and their children, Peter declares, quote, ye are an holy nation, end of quote. 1 Peter 2, verse 9. This is a reason why we doctrinal ecclesiastical and spiritual Calvinists so highly treasure the true church, involve ourselves in her life, seek her welfare, are concerned about her purity of doctrine and behavior, and defend her against her enemies. She is God's kingdom in the world. She is God's New Testament Zion. In the church occurs the main cultural activity of any human being, the public worship of God. In addition, the true church gives the believer the directions and spiritual energy to live the life of the kingdom in all the other spheres of human life. The dynamo of the kingdom of God is not the Christian college, and certainly not the Christian college that thinks to equip the kingdom builders with the feeble power of a common grace of God. The dynamo of the kingdom is the true church, and the power with which the church equips the citizens of the kingdom is the mighty resurrection grace of the Lord Jesus Christ. The church is Christ's kingdom. And the God-given calling of the true church is not to Christianize the world, get involved in politics, solve all the social problems, alleviate poverty and the rest. The calling of the church is to preach the gospel administer the sacraments, exercise discipline, and help the poor in the church. Belgic Confession, Article 29. The calling of the church is spiritual, not political, and not social. The second sphere of earthly life in which most citizens of the kingdom submit to King Jesus and fly his banner is marriage and the family. Common sense realizes the fundamental importance of this sphere for all of social life and for the welfare of an earthly nation that our political leaders evidently are unseeing and are actively at work to destroy marriage and the home are due not only to the natural darkness of their understanding because of unbelief, but also because of God's blinding of them in his judicial wrath. Scripture insists on the importance of the sphere of the home and family and gives thorough instruction concerning the will of King Jesus for life in this sphere, the Creator married one man and one woman 
in an intimate relation of one flesh for life. And the Creator blessed the marriage with fruitfulness in bringing forth children whom the married couple, their parents, must rear. Genesis 1 and 2. King Jesus took this ordinance over into his kingdom. And he made his will concerning our life in marriage and the family known to us in Ephesians 5 and 6 and in other places. There is much talk today by the culture Calvinists about Christianizing our society. These same people and their churches are tolerating rampant divorce and remarriage in their own churches. There is even open promotion of sodomy in their denominational paper and in their flagship college. Their unconcern for marriage in the family shows that they are not serious about the coming of the kingdom of God. They are not even serious about influencing the culture of Grand Rapids and the United States. Marriage and the family are the urgent social issues in North America today. The great evils plaguing our country are divorce, remarriage, sexual promiscuity, and the breakup of the family. The man who lives faithfully with his wife, the wife who keeps her vow to her husband, the parents who together raise their children in the fear of the Lord, the children and young people who honor their parents and heed their godly instruction. These are living the life of the kingdom. These are extending the kingship of God into the sphere of the family. And these are flying the banner of King Jesus for all to see. A third significant sphere is the education of children as both scripture and nature teach us. Citizens of the kingdom of God submit to the reign of Jesus Christ in the sphere of education. Thus the kingdom extends into the sphere of education. Over the sphere of education, we raise the banner, quote, not one square inch about which Jesus Christ does not say, mine, end of quote. We give our children a godly upbringing at home, including the example of our own lives of submission to King Jesus, and including discipline of the children. We see to it that the children receive thorough instruction in the history and doctrines of the Bible in the solid catechism program of a true church. In addition, with like-minded reformed believers, we provide for our children good Christian schools in which trained, competent Calvinistic teachers prepare the children to live and to work ably in 21st century America as subjects of King Jesus. We do that by instructing the children in all the branches of knowledge in light of the word of God as most parents lack both the time and the ability to do. Here, in a way, our zeal for the kingdom of Christ must become evident to everybody. We pay for these good Christian schools ourselves. The state, that is, the other tax-paying citizens, do not support our schools. We support our schools in addition to funding the state schools, an obvious injustice that the government does not redress and that apparently does not trouble the other citizens of the country. The result of this rearing in good Christian schools is that our sons and daughters become good citizens of the United States, the best citizens of the nation, capable responsible, hardworking, law-abiding, tax-paying. But 
our motive in thus rearing our children is not primarily, primarily to influence the United States or the world. Rather, our motive in this education is the kingdom of God. Our children from birth and already before birth are citizens of the kingdom of Christ. They belong to King Jesus. And therefore, they must be educated in the truths and ways of the kingdom of Jesus Christ. Of infants of believers, Jesus said on one occasion, quote, suffer the infants to come to me, for of such is the kingdom of God, end of quote, Luke 18, 16. A fourth sphere of earthly life in which we hold aloft the banner of King Jesus is labor. Calvinists, businessmen, financiers, and farmers run their enterprises honestly, provide fairly, even liberally, for their employees, and with their well-gotten wealth, quote, do good and are rich in good works, ready to distribute, willing to communicate, that is, to give to the needy, end of quote, in obedience to the charge of Jesus Christ in 1 Timothy 6, verse 18. They do this not because some labor union in disobedience to the fifth commandment and to the New Testament precept that employees be subject to their employers forces them to do so, or because a civil government influenced by Karl Marx usurps the authority to redistribute wealth. But they do this because Calvinistic businessmen, although fully conscious that they did build their companies, know that they are not lords of their companies. Jesus Christ is Lord in business and finance. And then the sphere of labor the reformed working man is diligent and reliable, submitting to the authority even of a froward employer. For God's sake, 1 Peter 2, verse 18. The reformed working man rejects the revolution and violence of labor unions, even though this may mean financial loss and suffering. Because in the sphere of labor, the rule of King Jesus in his heart causes him to be subject to King Jesus in that sphere as in every other. Finally, I mentioned the sphere of politics and government. On this, the culture Calvinists place heavy emphasis. Abraham Kuyper did. A prominent feature of Kuyper's project to Christianize the Netherlands was to form a pro political party that would propel him into the office of prime minister in that nation. This achievement of political power by that extraordinary man fascinates his disciples today. That sort of showy accomplishment by a uniquely gifted Calvinist is what they are impressed by and what they are really after when they proclaim the coming of the kingdom and the Christianizing of the world. But this is exactly contrary to the message of the gospel of the kingdom in New Testament scripture. Not many wise men after the flesh, not many noble, not many mighty, not many Abraham Kuypers has Jesus Christ called into his kingdom. Rather, he has chosen the foolish, the weak, the base, and the nobodies, quote, that no flesh should glory in his presence. End of quote. 1 Corinthians 1, 26 through 29. Accordingly, the kingdom of God is extended into every sphere of life, for the most part, in very unnoticed, obscure ways. No trumpet is blaring. No balloons are dropping from the ceiling. No television cameras are following the action. This is true particularly of the kingdom life of Calvinists in the realm of government. 
submit to your rulers and pay your taxes. Romans 13, 1 through 7. Because you know that God has ordained the civil powers. Now it's such, at such simple, ordinary behavior, the culture Calvinists jeer. They want political parties. They want noble men and women in high office. In fact, some are advocating and taking part in high-profile, glamorous revolutions. But the Word of God says that those who simply submit and pay their taxes, and that's the vast majority of Christians in all ages and in all nations, quote, have praise, end quote, of the government in behalf of God, whose servant government is. Romans 13, verse 3. In his inimitable way, Luther affirmed the ordinary behavior of the lowly and no account as the usual life of the kingdom. I quote Luther, A faithful servant girl does more good, accomplishes more, and is far more dependable, even if she only takes a sack from the back of an ass than all the priests and monks who sing themselves to death day and night while making bloody martyrs of themselves. End of quote. This is the kingdom life of the doctrinal, ecclesiastical, and spiritual Calvinists in distinction from the kingdom dream of the cultural Calvinists. We are citizens of the kingdom of Jesus Christ. His reign goes on in our hearts, and therefore we live the life of the kingdom in all spheres of life, earthly as well as spiritual. And as we live this spiritual life, we witness to the world of the ungodly. What now is the expectation of us citizens of the heavenly kingdom of Jesus Christ? What is our expectation with regard to the kingdom of which we are citizens, the kingdom we promote, and the kingdom whose banner flies over our life in all the spheres? In this life, in history, and in fact, in the near future, we expect hatred, fierce opposition, and outright persecution. We expect the very opposite of the appreciation and cooperation on the part of the world of the ungodly that Kuiper and the Common Grace cultural Calvinists are looking for. There is antithesis opposition and hostility between the kingdom of Jesus Christ and its citizens on the one hand and the kingdom of man, now with a capital M, and its citizens on the other hand. God has placed this enmity between the two kingdoms. I will put enmity between thee and the woman and between thy seed and her seed. Genesis 3, verse 15. Two kingdoms are at war in history, and that war is intensifying as I speak. The Heidelberg Catechism recognizes this warfare in its explanation of the petition about the coming of the kingdom of God. Quote, destroy the works of the devil and all violence which would exalt itself against thee, and also all wicked counsels devised against thy holy word, end of quote. Jesus warned us, forewarned us, that the result of our being in the world, but not of the world, would be that the world would hate us, not look kindly on our kingdom life and pitch in to help us with it. I quote Jesus, 
The world hath hated them, because they are not of the world, even as I am not of the world. John 17, verse 14. We spiritual, doctrinal, and ecclesiastical Calvinists do not expect the carnal triumph of the kingdom of Christ in history. We do not expect the Christianizing of the world, nor does scripture promise the Christianizing of the world. Nevertheless, we who now live the kingdom life of Jesus Christ and who promote the kingdom of the Lord Jesus Christ will have the victory. For the kingdom that is now established in our hearts, the kingdom that is the true church, and the kingdom that extends in our lives to all spheres of earthly life will triumph. The victory of this kingdom of grace is certain. It will destroy the rival kingdom of the beast, will punish and cast into hell all the citizens of the kingdom of the beast. It will establish itself perfectly over all the new creation. And in that kingdom, we will reign with King Jesus over all things forever. To this, the Heidelberg Catechism directs our hope as Reformed Christians. In the conclusion of its explanation, of the second petition of the model prayer, I quote, till the full perfection of thy kingdom take place, wherein thou, God triune in Jesus Christ, shalt be all in all, end of quote. That will not happen within history. Within history, as is taking place today, Satan's outwardly grand kingdom of man, with a capital M, in which man is all in all as much as possible, develops itself to the fullest. This grand kingdom of man is anti-God, anti-Christ, anti-church. It is lawless. It will persecute the citizens of the kingdom of God for their witness to Jesus for their confession that God is God, and for their life of obedience to the law of God. And now something astonishing. According to Abraham Kuyper himself, this godless anti-Christian kingdom will be the final full development of the common grace project of Christianizing the world. In volume one of his three volumes set on common grace, Kuiper wrote this, and I quote, the closing scene in the drama of common grace can be enacted only through the appearance on the stage of the man of sin. Common grace leads to the most powerful manifestation of sin in history. All those, therefore, presently engaged in erecting and promoting the kingdom of common grace are in fact helping Satan to realize his anti-Christian kingdom. I have bad news for them. The wrath of God rests upon their project in history. Their kingdom will be demolished in the day of Jesus Christ. The little stone of Daniel 2 will fall upon it and grind it to powder. The victory and perfection of the kingdom of Jesus Christ, the kingdom of the grace of God in Jesus Christ, our kingdom will triumph as the goal of history and everlastingly. This is certain as certain as it is that Jesus arose to become Lord of all, and as certain as it is that the God and Father of Jesus Christ must be all in all. This is our hope, the triumph of the kingdom of Jesus Christ forever when he comes again. With this hope, let us live the kingdom life faithfully, 
promote the kingdom actively, fly the banner of the kingdom without shame or fear, yes, and patiently endure scorn and suffering for the sake of this kingdom and its king. The kingdom of Jesus Christ and his particular sovereign kingdom building grace are coming. I thank you for your attention. <laughs>